Have you ever heard yourself saying, I wish I knew that in my 20s? Or maybe you're in your 20s now and you're looking for wisdom and insight to help you navigate faith, life, and relationships. Well, stay tuned as Kelly and Peter Worrell, authors of 20 Things We Tell Our 20-Something Selves, share their insights to give you guidance and help you grow. Welcome to Everlasting Love. It's so great to have you joining us today. My name is Lisa Bishop, and we have an awesome show in store for you. Today we have the authors of the book, 20 Things We Tell Our 20-Something Selves. Peter and Kelly Worrell are here. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you. I, yeah, I know uh, Kelly did our women's retreat not, not too long ago, so... We've uh, known each other for a little while, and as we were walking and talking today, we're thinking, I should know Peter by now because I feel like I know a little bit about <laughs> you, but I finally got to hear your accent in, right. in person, so we get to hear that today. But welcome to the show. Just a pleasure to have you guys, and something I'm really excited about. I work with 20-somethings, and your book really resonated with me, with the population that I work with a lot, but myself too, and I'm not 20 anymore. Right. Yeah. So the thing I yeah. really love about this book is that it's not, I mean, the title is 20 Things We Tell Our 20-Something Selves, and mm -hmm. so that the market may be 20-somethings, but you could be really any age mm -hmm. and, and yeah. learn and relearn some things here. Right. So Absolutely. I was like reading it again, bookmarking, so excited yeah. to hear more about that and your journey and yeah. writing the book too. But we always yeah. love to hear mm -hmm. your stories right. so people get to know you a little bit more before we dig yeah. into the book. So Kelly, we'll start with you. Just okay. tell us a little bit about yourself and mm -hmm. your coming to faith yeah. and what, you know, what you're doing now for the kingdom. Okay. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota, Minneapolis area, and uh, both my parents were believers and so they brought me to church from the time I was born. And uh, both my parents also had cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. So they were disabled and had some physical limitations, but they loved Jesus and 
Some of my earliest memories are of waking up in the morning and my dad pouring over his Bible. Wow. And uh, so that's just a super rich heritage that mm -hmm. I'm very thankful for. Uh, went to a little Baptist church growing up. And when I was about eight years old, one Sunday night, the church watched uh, one of the rapture movies that were very popular oh in the goodness. 70s. What was that I was like eight years <laughs> old watching, I think it was called A Thief in the Night. Wow. And Patty Joe in the movie is left behind. So it's kind of the original left behind. Right. And it terrified me. No kidding. I was so scared. And, and I already knew the gospel, of course. I've been learning Bible stories, again, from the time I was born. So I understood the gospel on some level, but after watching that movie, I was so scared mm -hmm. of going to hell and being left behind and those things. And right. so I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my heart like every day. And I can a few <laughs> months later, we had a Sunday school teacher who asked our Sunday school class, you know, how many of you have, have given your life to Jesus Christ? And my good friend Debbie, who was much more extroverted than I, uh, shouted out, I do that every day. And, and I was so glad she did because I did that every day too. Right. And so that Sunday school teacher took the time to really explain the gospel, kind of, you know, the once and for all nature of, of a relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I point to that time. That night I went home and talked to my mom again and we prayed together. Wow. So At what point would you yeah. say your faith took root and you were really kind of aware of yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I understood it, like I said, when I was at that age, but of course it grows and it develops. Yeah. And uh, I was the good church kid for most of my adolescence and teen years. But there's some rebellion in there too mm -hmm. and testing the waters and you know, figuring out like every teenager who I am and, and what this faith is going to mean to me and, right. and trying to own it um, and continued that journey through college. I think probably in the middle of my college, years really realized that this was for life mm. and it was something I was choosing for mm -hmm. my life mm -hmm. um, and knowing that I wanted to go into ministry and, and serve God with my life. I mean, what more would I want to do? Wow, so and you were really convinced of I that. I was convinced of college. wanting to do ministry in college and wow. kind of set my sights on that. And so tell yeah. us a little bit then of, about since college, how yeah. you've been engaging in ministry and you're engaging in it now. Yeah, so I was a communications major in undergrad and a lot of my peers were, you know, this was in the 90s, so a lot of my peers, I was a writing major specifically, uh, technical writing, so a lot of my friends in my program were getting jobs at IBM and were writing computer manuals and had these great careers in that industry, which didn't interest me in the least. Right. Because uh, right. I just, I knew I wanted to write, but for the sake of the kingdom. And so I started sending applications to Christian publishing companies wow. uh, wherever I could find them. And uh, that was pre-internet, so it was a little bit harder to oh even figure goodness. out that who they were, right? It seems like forever ago. <laughs> um, and so that's what landed me in Chicago, a Christian publishing company in Schaumburg. A regular Baptist Press hired me to write and edit children's curriculum wow. for churches. And so did that for a while and then went to seminary mm -hmm. while I was there at Trinity and uh, started to revisit the idea of teaching. Uh, I thought maybe about teaching in, in my undergrad and came back to that and just really sensed God's leading in that. And I thought a friend of mine was teaching at Moody Bible Institute at the time. Okay. And I saw what she was doing and just thought it sounded amazing and to be able to work with students in that way. And I thought, you know, maybe when I'm in my 50s or 60s, I'll be mature enough in the faith <laughs> to be entrusted with a ministry like that. Uh, but then God opened the door in 1998 for me to join the faculty there. So I've been wow. there And you've since. been there ever since, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, professor at Moody Bible Institute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thus yeah. probably a lot, of, uh, a lot of material for the book yeah. that you guys wrote. Yeah. <laughs> like your main, main population yeah. kind of coming into their, into their 20s. Mm -hmm. Peter, how about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself and well, your, your faith journey and yes. where that's led you to current day. Yeah, I, uh, I'm obviously not from Minnesota. I'm from England, the country of. <laughs> and I was uh, born into a household that was somewhat divided. My mother had promised to take me to church as part of a christening, and my father was not going to see the inside of a church. Mm. So it was quite a divided household. My mother 
It took me along to church as part of the promise. And in taking me to church, she actually became a Christian. Wow. In rather miraculous ways, actually. She was mm. healed of, of some severe depression and things when she became a Christian. My father noted that and thought it was great, but he didn't want to give up his lifestyle, his way of thinking about things. And so I came home every day to a mother who loved Jesus and a father who didn't. And my father would introduce me to things which were really spiritually unhelpful. Mm -hmm. And my mother would introduce me to things that were very spiritually helpful. And then I remember when I was about eight years old, I came home and a little old lady in our church who owned a bookstore had given me a quiz to do. Okay. And like most eight-year-olds, I really didn't want to do the quiz. Right. <laughs> I didn't want to do this extra worksheet. And my mother said, you know, consider the little old lady. You know, don't hurt her feelings. Do the test. Mm -hmm. So I, I did this quiz test thing. And one of the questions on there, the, the typical bait and switch kind of thing, was, are you a Christian? Really? And I drew a picture of a door and drew myself halfway through it. Huh. And my mother said, well, you're either a Christian or you're not. You, you can't be in between. Right. And so I said, yeah, all right, then I'll, I'll become a Christian. And I knelt down with my mother by the side of the bed and, and became a Christian at that point, not really understanding what it meant. Mm -hmm. But you asked Kelly just now when the faith became more serious. <laughs> For me, I went to a state school. And in the state school, they were still able to do a passion play every Easter. And what happened for me at around eight, nine, ten years old, somewhere in there, it, it's hard to remember when, I had a German teacher, a teacher from Germany called Mr. Kemner, I remember him very well, and he laid out the passion play for us, and I raised my hand in class and I said, I don't think it went quite like that. <laughs> and he looked at me with his German accent, he said, yeah, well, let me have a look at that. <laughs> and I will go home and have a look. So he went home and he came back. And he said, Peter, you're all right. You will be Jesus. Oh, my <laughs> word. So I literally got crucified for oh, it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and because of that, I couldn't really hide my faith because I got crucified in front of a public school. <laughs> oh and then uh, after I was killed, I remember I had to drop down into the stage underneath, and then I was resurrected again <laughs> wow. and, and came back in front of everybody as Jesus at about eight to ten years old. Quite in an experience. Somewhere. And then the public school children called me Jesus for the rest of my school life. Wow. And so when I would go down the hallways, they would sing what they could remember of Christian hymns. Uh, it was just expected that I would be Jesus. But I sometimes embraced it and I sometimes pushed against it. Mm. But forever with my school, I was Jesus. <laughs> so how, how did you see your life? transform as mm -hmm. a result of becoming a follower of Christ? Like what is... Yeah, in those early years, I had a secularized view. I had a compartment for Jesus and a compartment for neutral things, so I thought the secular. And so a lot of people think secularism is similar to atheism, hmm. but actually secularism is the compartmentalizing, is putting into categories. And so I was with Jesus on a Sunday and I couldn't escape the fact that I was a Christian during the week, but I listened to music, which I really embraced that wasn't really in line with my Christian values. I read books, watched TV, hung out with friends and did things that just really weren't in line with my Christian values. Mm. But then I turned it on on a Sunday and that would run into a Monday and dissolve by a Tuesday. And so that secularism was there at about age 16, 17. I decided to get serious about sharing my faith. And a lot of my friends who were in sports teams hadn't become Christians. So I decided that I would share the gospel, which was about getting people saved in my way of thinking, not about a whole new way of life. Hmm. And I, I went around the school and I found people. I found them in the library. I found them in the TV resource center for the school, people who uh, the rest of the year hadn't really embraced. and they became Christians. And so it ended up like we had this little Christian group of misfits wow. that would go through high school together. And we would hang out in the TV resource center and we would hang out in the library and then we'd go around and do things together. And so I thought, since a lot of my friends have become Christian, I think I should be a missionary. 
Wow. And so at age 18, I went to Pakistan for a year as a missionary to serve the Lord there, but I went with entirely the wrong attitude. Mm. I went as if I was doing things for God. Mm. Doing Him a favor. Doing Him mm. a favor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, look, look God, I, I got look all these I'm people doing. saved in high yeah. school. Now I'll go to Pakistan and save an Islamic country. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. That, that'll go well. <laughs> <laughs> it, obviously, you've heard the news about Pakistan. It didn't all turn right. to Christ. <laughs> and right. and my, my impact was uh, minimal to nothing. On, on them, but Pakistan had a larger impact on me. Mm. I came back to England and in my undergraduate studies, I, uh, in my early 20s, I studied with a professor who was a, a lesbian Catholic who didn't believe in God at all, but oh. was teaching theology. Mm. So I, I studied theology at an Anglican school, as well as studying to become an elementary school teacher. And she attacked my faith for four years solid. She found it very offensive that I was an evangelical Bible-believing Christian. Mm. And so she definitely put me in her crosshairs, along with there were 15 other evangelicals in our year group, and she went after us all. And there were only two of us, really, at the end who would still call themselves Bible-believing evangelical Christians. The rest had become Marxist revolutionary theologians. Mm. And so this was a, a very forming time where I had my back against the wall, and I kind of realized I'm not going to give up on this faith. Wow. But I don't know why I believe it anymore. Mm. <laughs> so it was, it was like I couldn't show off the God. I was stripped of all of the, the medals I had mm. for all my godly behavior, like I could prove something to God. Yeah. I had failed multiple times in many ways, and still for some reason God held hold of me. And, uh, and that w then took me into my 20s, a little bit of a wreck, but a wreck that was held by God. Wow, wow. And today you are doing work for the kingdom in what capacities? I, I capacities am. I actually wife. teach at Moody <laughs> Bible Institute with my wife. So the, the way I got there was that I was in Japan and then Pakistan after I graduated from college. And I, in Pakistan, realized that I was being given more and more responsibilities in a missionary school to teach Christian things. And my faith didn't really hold water in the right way to be able to teach children those things. And so I came to Moody Graduate School in Chicago. And there was an undergraduate school professor there called uh, Kelly Collisar, who's now called Kelly Worrell. <laughs> and with uh, Kelly Collisar, I made good connections with Moody, and a few years later, after I'd been teaching in the Chicago suburbs for a while, opportunity came for me to be able to come back into the city and, and teach there too. And after God had done a work to really turn my life right side up, as, as well as my thinking and my, my heart and everything just was, went right for a change. When all that happened, God gave me the blessing of teaching at Moody Bible Institute, which mm. is actually a dream occupation, not because I get to teach next to my wife, which is a wonderful thing, but both of us would say that our first love is God. And yeah. so to get to serve God with each other is a real blessing for us both. I think there's some story about meeting you in the cafeteria <laughs> or something. We, 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 won't, we won't go there, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's a relief for me, because again, I, I'm I think still there's two going, sides to there, how the there story is two went. Sides. That's true. <laughs> there, there's Kelly's Go side, my side, and yes, you'll have that. Level. That's a little teaser. You'll have, to, <laughs> you'll have to get the book to know the story. It's really good. Oh dear. Well, let's let's dive into the book. Yeah. So, uh, twenty things we'd tell our twenty-something selves. I think uh, you mentioned that it kind of was birthed out of an article that you wrote. So yeah. tell tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So in I think it was 2013-14, that school year, uh, I had a sabbatical from Moody to work on a writing project. And it was actually a completely different writing project called This Odd House. Mm -hmm. And with This Odd House, I was kind of, I was writing my way through the spiritual journey because when I went to seminary, I studied spiritual formation and growth. And so I'm very interested in that. And so I was looking at childhood and how the different factors that help form us spiritually. And, and then got, was writing into adolescence and then got into, of course, the 20s. And I joke and I tell people, really, 
a better title for the book would be 20 things I was learning in my 40s <laughs> that I wish I had known in my 20s because if I had right. known them in my 20s, my 30s might have gone a yeah. whole lot better yeah. because my faith kind of fell apart. Mm. Um, and so I was reflecting on that as I was writing through. And so I wrote a little blog post called 20 things I might have told my 20 something self and posted it on my blog at thisodhouse.org. And, uh, and it seemed to resonate, so it did pretty well there. And so I sent it over to Relevant Magazine uh, and it did well at Relevant Magazine. And I was putting a book proposal out for This Odd House and I had some editors who were interested and we were in conversations and, and then 20 things happened. And so Moody Publishers came to me in wow. the midst of that and said, we think they had already passed on This Odd House, but they, think, they said, we think 20 things might be a book. And my first response was, no, 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 no. You know, hmm. This is what I want to do, This Odd House. And, uh, and then the door kept closing for this odd house. I kept hearing, not yet, no, platform, those kinds of things. And so kind of went back to Moody Publishers a few months later with my tail between my legs. If you're still <laughs> interested, mm -hmm. I think maybe God is moving in this direction. And so, wow, yeah. Just a reminder to me, like when we, when we listen and just, I mean, it started with mm -hmm. an article. You listening to God mm -hmm. and saying, hey, I think I'm gonna write this article. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden other opportunities yeah. open up. What was it like writing the book together? Is this your <laughs> first joint venture in book writing? Well, or in book writing, for, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I came home and said to Peter, apparently, we're writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we <laughs> are, are we? Okay. So, so tell us, give us a little bit of a, a sneak peek into some of the 20 things. What, what are the yeah. ones that mm -hmm. kind of maybe are your, your, they're probably all your favorites, but some mm -hmm. that come to mind that really oh, stand so. out? Well, we start with establishing the foundation, which is your worldview. Examine your foundation. I found that when I was going in my 20s, I didn't have a solid foundation on which I was building. As I had said with my father and with my mother and their conflicting opinions, with the media I was listening to, with the culture around me, I had what I would call a Swiss cheese foundation. Mm. You know, the, the cheese that has all the holes in it. And yeah. so, there was, there was nothing solid to build on. And so when I was confronted with very aggressive attacks on my faith, I'd retreat into, I believe it's so there. Mm. And, and it wouldn't really even convince me. And there were the, you know the person who goes after the faith, uh, Richard Dawkins, for example. Mm -hmm. I had to read his book, The Blind Watchmaker. And I would say I was profoundly shaken by his book. It was an in-class assignment that I had to defend an atheist perspective in the mode of, of Richard Dawkins. And after doing it, I thought, wow, why, why do I believe any of this stuff anymore? So the first chapter says, well, examine that foundation. Right. And a few chapters later, it says, and dig deeper than your doubt. Because many of us don't want to love God with all our mind. Hmm. It says, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we get into church and we get excited and, and our emotions well up and we think that this is love. But actually the New Testament word for love is more about the mind than it is about the emotions. And so the foundation, the beginning of the book is talking about aligning your mind, aligning your heart, aligning your focus with God like you said you would. Because mm -hmm. most of us when we became Christians knew that we were promising to commit ourselves to God. Mm -hmm. but we're not completely committed. We're not all in. Right. And so the first chapter really says as a 20 something, 30 something, 40 something, are you really all in? Right, and how do you know if you are? Well, and those questions uh, that we ask in that chapter really dig into it. I was working with my students on this and going back and forth with a group of 20 somethings and we came up with a set of worldview questions. And some of them are questions like, well, what do you value the most? Mm -hmm. what, what is most important to you? Now, we know the Sunday school answer, God is most important to us. But if somebody catches us during the, the day and says, what, what's most important to you? What do you value the most? What we get from most people, even in churches, is, oh, my friends, my family, mm -hmm. relationships. And those answers are not biblical answers. Right. So the focus on the family that we have is, is not necessarily biblical because the family should focus on God and that should be the focus of the family. So the, the family itself points to something or someone higher. 
but we frequently get stuck in these other areas of life and we make a deal with God where God makes our life better. And one of my crises in my 20s was at age 28, I had a breakup and it was like, God, this stinks. Yeah. I, I made a deal with you that you were meant to make my mm. life better and this is not better. We do that and our relationship mm. is often, did God come through? And that exactly. is a faulty way. Exactly, yeah. and when we say things like mm. God is good all the time, it, it means, well, God serves me in some way. I'll work out how this moved forward my agenda. Hmm. Whereas how did I move forward God's agenda and where's the joy in that? Right. So the first few chapters of the book are aligning us with where's your life headed? What did you commit to? What is the significance of your life? What do you need to big, uh, dig deeply into? And I find that with my students, I teach a class called Faith and Learning, hmm. and this really yeah. blows their mind, uh, especially people who think they've been raised in a Christian home and are Christians for years. They find they don't actually have a Christian worldview. Right. And, and right. that's mind-blowing to them. It's like, I'm a Christian. I must have a Christian worldview. Well, they've seen it modeled. They, mm. they, they hopefully have seen it modeled, but not even that. Or maybe that. not that, yeah. When you see the 40s and 50-somethings who are raising them, the patterns of their life are often more oriented around the mall and around getting the shopping done mm. and around getting tasks performed than they are around devotional acts towards God. Right. And so they've picked up that, yes, we're meant to love God, but if I look at where the time and the energy and the money and the acts of my parents went, that's actually what I've picked up. Mm, that makes, that uh, makes sense. I've oriented my life around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see, so how long have you guys been teaching? How many years? I've about? been there 18 years. So quite some yeah. time. I mean, do you see, like, what are some of the shifts that you see in the 20-somethings now as opposed mm -hmm. to the 20-somethings 18 years ago. Are mm -hmm. there major distinctions that you're noticing? Mm -hmm. And if so, what, what are some of those? Seems to be, I think, a change, I would say. I think, for one, we just get more and more plugged in. Like, mm -hmm. media becomes mm -hmm. more and more important to us, and we become more saturated and more addicted I would right. even say that you know mm -hmm. we have to have our phone we have to have yeah. we're just so which ironically you know you it's, we we believe the myth that it makes us more connected mm -hmm. because you know we've got all of our friends right in our hand but the reality is I think most of us feel less connected it's right. not a true depth of connection mm -hmm. and so I think that is one of the I think one of the most profound differences that mm -hmm. I've observed well it's funny because so. I actually I I put my thumb here in uh, number four choose your community mm -hmm. carefully mm -hmm. and you address that a little bit mm -hmm. uh, something the book says, your friends will give shape to your life. They will either stunt your growth or spur you on. Mm -hmm. And when you find good friends, keep them. They are like gold. Treasure them, invest in them, spur them on to be the kind of friend that you would like to have. So this chapter mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. on something you wish you would have known in your 20s, choosing yes. your community carefully. Mm -hmm. But then you even go on to say, we're more connected, more plugged in, more in touch with one another than ever before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From our handheld devices, we can text and email and message no matter where we are, at work, at right. school, at church, while we're sitting in a parking lot or sipping a latte. Mm -hmm. I like lattes. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> with <laughs> almond milk. A live mm -hmm. coffee date. In our pocket or in our purse, we have at our fingertips, a fantastic number of followers and friends, at least friends of the I favorite your photo, you like my status mm -hmm. variety. And mm -hmm. then you go on to quote um, someone, uh, Sherry Turkle, as it relates mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, technology. But then you say technology in and of itself is not the problem, though. Mm -hmm. right. So tell, tell us a little bit more about technology as part of the issue. And mm -hmm. we think mm -hmm. we're in community, but right. not. Mm -hmm. But tell us a little bit more about choosing your community and, mm -hmm. and that part of Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wish you would have yes. known that in your twenties, and you mm -hmm. want if right. you could scream from the mountaintops that right. you are with your mm -hmm. book, you would tell yes. twenty somethings about community. What what would you yeah. say? I think we underestimate how important it is and mm -hmm. what happens in community, and that God designed us for community. It's a gift from Him, and we are fundamentally created to crave it mm -hmm. and to long for it. Uh, but it's in community, and we talk about this in the chapter, I think, that so much of our formation happens. Like, right. we, I learn who I am. A lot of my identity is shaped, especially in those adolescents and then now into our 20s and those years. I'm figuring out who I am. Mm -hmm. 
And a big part of that is going to be happening in conversation, in community with mm -hmm. um, the people that are close to me. And so we learn who we are. We learn about our place in the world. A lot of, Peter was talking about our worldview, a lot of what we value, a lot of what we believe. Those mm -hmm. things are going to be shaped mm -hmm. by the people we let speak into our lives. Mm -hmm. And so right. it's a pretty important decision yeah. of who we give voice, who we give, you know, whose voices we listen to. Right. So how, yeah, how do you discern that? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, with community, uh, it's been said that we form, and then we storm, and then we norm, and then we perform, we, mm -hmm. we move forward. And what that means is that we make a community, and then we get into each other's stuff enough that it gets horrible, mm -hmm. and you have a blow up. And if you've been in a church small group, hopefully your small group got deep enough for it to get uncomfortable. Don't, okay, can we just stop there? I say that all the time. If you are not getting messy in community, mm. check your yes, pulse. Exactly. You're not putting it all on the table. And, and, yeah. that's, and that's where you can manage all that and make it sterile by not getting deep yeah. and by having a heavy amount of control, which technology allows you to do. Mm. I manage my profile. I'm so happy, super happy. Even though mm. I'm on drugs for depression, right. I, I show you this amazing picture of myself. Yeah. I manage my friendships and we talk positively to each other all the time and the positivity is wonderful. I love the positivity of my millennial and post-millennial students. I mean it is a wonderful mm -hmm. energy and positivity but if there's conflict, mm -hmm. if there's some way of, uh, we even pretend in these uh, millennial groups that we're all still agreeing when actually we've said things that are profoundly incompatible with each other. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's an inability to dig past that conflict mm -hmm. because we've sterilized everything so that it can't hurt us and we've kept it superficial. Mm. So we have to have ways of entering into the pain and mm -hmm. saying, I love you mm -hmm. and I profoundly disagree with you. Right, mm. and that that's okay. Like and we take disagreement, okay. we're easily offended, we think right. conflict mm. is bad and it's not right. that conflict can help us and grow. You don't love me anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't love me because you disagree with me. Hmm. And now you've hurt my feelings. And so my feelings are hurt. I need to unfriend you. Yeah. I need to like give you a little bit of space. I need to not take this call. Mm -hmm. because I, I really only ever talk to you on the phone or mm -hmm. text you and so I'm going to block you for a while until my feelings calm down mm -hmm. and then we might get back to the superficial so happy place where we pretend we agree again later. Right. I'm just going to read another excerpt. This is the community thing. You have mm -hmm. um, something say you say communitas, not community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you say images of community are present in just about every adventure series you can name. Star Wars, mm -hmm. Matrix, Lord of the Rings, and we love these stories. We're drawn into the journey, the quest, and the need to survive, but two, the sense of camaraderie that calls us, that image of a group of people banding together around a common goal. This is community mm -hmm. at its best. Mm -hmm. But this sort of community is hard to find in our culture, a culture which values safety and security and stability over sacrifice. We prefer comfort and convenience over anything costly. We are individualistic mm -hmm. and competitive. And in order for us to win, we accept that those around us will lose. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to say, um, we live as if the community should serve us, not as if we should serve the community. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that and the, the impact that it can have. Yeah, I think on multiple levels. I think with our engagement with church, uh, whether it's on a small group level or even on the, the larger community of a church, you know, we're so consumeristic, I guess, is what I, you mm -hmm. know, I hear in that. And uh, since from, you know, we, we go and it's the question in our mind is, you know, how, what am I getting? What am I receiving? Rather than what am I bringing to the table? Right. What am I offering? You know, mm -hmm. we go to worship and it's very easy to church hop. We go and does this please me? Do I feel good here? Is it, you know, tickling my ears? And uh, and then if it's not, well, it's very easy uh, to move on and try something different. Mm -hmm. And so being willing, like we're saying, to stick it out and to, mm -hmm. even when it's messy, and to what am mm -hmm. I bringing? Mm -hmm. What am I, what do I have to offer? Our church has recently started 
trying to press into this a little bit on mm -hmm. Sunday morning worship even. Yeah. It's a smaller community, so maybe we're able to do that more than some of our large churches, but having people give testimony in the service, having people read scripture, having people uh, bring something to the table mm -hmm. for worship, and mm -hmm. I've been s really blessed by yes. it. And it's been Somehow, the 20-somethings the really understand the principle of participation of mm -hmm. not just coming along and watching. I mean, they can do that on TV, they can do that uh, in a movie theater, but when they come to church to participate is something that opens many doors for them. And it takes some guts to participate. Yeah. But with communitas, communitas is community towards a purpose. Mm -hmm. A potluck is not generally a communitas, it's just a community, it's a group of people together. Mm -hmm. Communitas is actually moving towards a project. There was a church I heard about once that everybody got together around the project of building a new wing on the church. So everybody did fundraisers and the harmony in the church, it was, it was just humming, it was just moving really, mm. really sweetly. And then once it got built, the infighting started, there was nothing really to do, mm -hmm. and the church lost the membership that was meant to fill the wing mm. because they sat there in passivity. And uh, the, you know the old phrase, the devil will find work for idle hands to do? Mm -hmm. And it, it's true that if you're just sat there and nothing is expected of you, you don't have a mode to grow, you don't have a, a leveling up that you're meant to achieve towards a particular purpose. You can just come, and you know, some churches now, you can come, you can get a latte in the foyer, you come in and you passively listen to the best speakers in the land, and then you go out into the, the um, parking lot and you drive away and the whole consumer thing, did it matter that I was there today? Hmm. If I didn't show up to this mm -hmm. church, would anything in the church have been different? Maybe the, the professional greeter would have had one less hand to shake. Hmm. And 20-somethings and are, are waking up to this. They, they think this is just pointless. Wow. And, and they are very savvy. I mean, we tend to talk negatively about 20-somethings. They've been marketed to all their life in mm. increasing measure, and they are open to marketing techniques. Their eyes are open, they see it. Right, they're more, they're, they're more transparently right. can kind yeah. of see what's right. like. What are some other things uh, in the book, some other favorite tw of the 20 things that mm -hmm. come to mind for you? Mm -hmm. What's another one that you could share with us briefly? Yeah, um, I think if I could just speak overarching for yeah. a second, uh, one thing that was really just blessed me as we were putting it together, when I wrote that original article, uh, it grew out of, as I was saying earlier, a lot of thinking and writing and praying about the spiritual journey. But when I wrote the actual blog post, I didn't think it was going to be a book, right? <laughs> so I just kind of put came together very quickly, and I didn't think a lot about the organization or the structure of it. And then when we went to do the book, uh, and to look at them a little more closely and think, all right, how should these be ordered, for example? Is there com are there common themes? Uh, I, just to see God's hand in the structure of it, and we moved a few of them around, but you know, if people ask me, what's the thesis? Like, what's, what's the book mm -hmm. about? And I, Peter was talking about how the first few speak to the mind, and they do, and the middle section, the middle things, uh, I think speak to kind of how we walk out our faith on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. What does this look like? And so some of those are, you know, habits, fostering good habits, uh, getting rest, feeding yourself, mm -hmm. you know, these daily choices that we make that our faith should be impacting those choices on a daily basis. And that's a good point, because sometimes yeah. we compartmentalize what exactly. our faith should be impacting, but yeah. God's like mm -hmm. every yeah. corner of our yes. life. Yeah. Yes, everything. Yeah, and then the last several dig kind of deep on a soul level, and it's, you know, how do we love God with our heart? Mm. And so pressing into pain, uh, seeking healing from past trauma, mm. living loved, uh, mm. taking sin seriously, also embracing grace yeah. and so and so when I looked at that and I took a step back I was just sort of blessed by God to think what is the thesis it's love God mm. with your heart with your soul mm. with your mind and your strength yes. and I couldn't think of a better thesis for a book you know <laughs> <laughs> like hey, there it is Bible. it must be pretty <laughs> awesome how do we do that <laughs> and so it's kind of our little humble attempt in the end of what might that look like 
yeah. uh, in these days. I so. like. I really, honestly love this book. And one of the things I love about it, I love the questions at the end of each mm -hmm. chapter. They're so thought provoking and they're just mm -hmm. deep and they get the wheels turning because sometimes mm -hmm. questions can kind of be, you know, one word answers, but mm -hmm. you really have mm -hmm. to, it really causes you to, to think and develop your thinking around mm -hmm. and thoughts around these things. Yeah. Tell yeah. me a little bit about one of them is, uh, it talks about take your sin seriously. I think yeah. that's what, <laughs> do, yes. tell, do you think that's happening less these days or tell, yeah. tell us a little bit about well, that? Well, because there is no evil. So because mm. there is no evil, there's nothing to guard against. Everybody's basically good. Mm. The world is a wonderful place. We just make great choices and sometimes we make mistakes. Mm. But the latest road trip movie will show me how I can do hideous, terrible things and it'll all be all right in the end. Yeah, and in, so in two hours it gets resolved. In, in two right? hours it gets resolved. Ups, so there's yeah. this mm. wild optimism of the world's a wonderful place, things are gonna work out fine, and, and somehow, no matter who I sleep with, no matter mm. how drunk I get, uh, the, the road trip movie gives me the gospel that tells me it's all gonna work out okay, mm. and, and I can just experience everything. It, it's part of what would be called an existential worldview. Mm -hmm. So the existential worldview of this world is meaningless, everything is meaningless, but I'm going to create my own meaning, yeah. and the way I'm gonna play it out is by just embracing every experience hmm. and live life to the full. That tends to be what the you only live once kind of thing of five years ago has, has become. It, it's just do everything and, and try it. If it doesn't kill you, it only makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not true. Right. That's not true. These things are, are like, uh, <laughs> I, I've got the idea of mines going off underwater that just send ripples mm -hmm. out and rip mm -hmm. apart submarines. It's, uh, these, these things that you choose to do earlier in your life, they affect your soul, they affect the yeah. souls of the people around you, they, they even affect future relationships. Yeah. And while you're casually just giving your body to one person mm. or, or drinking until you throw up or do something really irresponsible, and, uh, these really strongly embrace social actions of today they lead to very severe consequences mm -hmm. in the future. And even if you don't see physical, horrible consequences, they're ripping apart the fabric of who you were created mm -hmm. to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that is really important. Mm -hmm. Evil is real, mm -hmm. sin is real. The way we've defined evil and made it just attributable to people like Hitler or, or the latest supervillain on a, on a superhero movie, it's not just for them. Mm -hmm. Evil, in the way that the Bible describes it, is anything that stands in the way of God's flourishing in, in the world, in our lives, in our soul. And we have, in many ways, caused evil to flourish mm -hmm. by not taking our sin seriously. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's one of those things, I was just talking to a friend the other day, mm -hmm. and, and when I was 16, I kinda thought I knew everything I needed to know, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's just like, ah! You know, we have books like this to hopefully awaken people mm -hmm. because, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, mm -hmm. And, you know, even through your book, you're, I think, kind of trying to wave mm -hmm. some warning mm -hmm. signals too lovingly, like, hey, mm -hmm. we, we want you to get this now. Like, sa yes. like yeah. save yourself, like right. the wreckage, right. really, yes. because we yes. don't realize that the right. decisions I'm making now, to your point, they impact yes. me and they, right. we don't live in a vacuum. Like, we don't right. realize that yes. our choices don't just impact right. the one who makes the choice. Right. We, we give a concrete right. example in there. My mother's very proud of this because my mother <laughs> likes to be humble. Way to make so, your mama proud. But she tells everybody, <laughs> I'm in the sin chapter, she says. <laughs> I take you're sincere. <laughs> so what happened with my mother is that in her early 20s, she got married at 20, she and my father would argue and they, they just get cathartic words out at each mm. other. And they'd think, great, we have told each other what we think about each other and that's out there and now it's done. Well, the walls in my house were paper thin. Yeah. And my earliest memories are those words that mm. they yelled at each other because of the, the grief and the fear about my parents that it created in my heart. And, and I remember my father and my mother screaming downstairs, my mother uh, slamming the door as she left, the glass mm. shattering. I remember snow coming in through the window pane. And that is my earliest memory. Mm. 
And what did they think? They just thought, we're having a row. We're, we're getting our stuff out at each other. Right. But they didn't realize that their 40-year-old son would look back as that, mm. as his earliest memory. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. so taking that sin seriously, if they had known it, they, they would have been grieved. They would have been horrified. Mm. So tell us a little bit about uh, the good, the bad, and the miserable. That's something on the back of your uh, <laughs> book that you talk about. So what, what are some of those things that you talk mm. about in the book that really helped form you in your, I think, mm -hmm. mostly your 30s, the, the, mm -hmm. the miserable part. Yeah. Yes. But what are some of the experiences yeah. that, as you look back on, God really used to, to shape you, to learn from, and things that, that you can mm -hmm. share with those mm -hmm. who are listening that could offer them some kind of guidance? Yeah, I think the tough part, the miserable part, did happen in our 30s, mm -hmm. which uh, it was kind of the impetus for the book. Like I joked earlier, it's, I got to my 40s and I saw what happened in my 30s when we came up against uh, infertility in particular, but also the death of three of our four parents in a mm -hmm. very short amount of time. So I kind of call it our Job period. I know many of us have that season where it's just thing after thing after thing. Right. And so for us, it was about six years and, and I didn't handle it well. My mm -hmm. faith was on the knife edge. I mean, mm -hmm. Peter would say, he's like, I didn't know where my wife was gonna land after all this. Mm -hmm. yeah. When the dust settled, what was what was I holding on to? And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, it just a lot of depression and fear and anger at God. Um, but then he was so faithful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And let, let's hang on the fear and depression for just yeah. a minute because it's. I really just appreciate that you said that mm -hmm. because I think sometimes, especially when we are older and you know people don't see the the wreckage that has happened prior, mm -hmm. they think we've just ta da landed on our feet and life has been good. But the reality <laughs> is that is not life, and God right. never right. says that life is going yes. to be this easy stroll through the park. Right. There are going to be mm -hmm. difficulties, yes. and even as you talk about here, you know, yes. doubt and. You know, you were on the knife edge. You didn't know where you were going to land. T t mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about, yeah. like, why is it okay to wrestle in our faith? Why, why, like, yeah, yeah talk about that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I was diagnosed with adjustment disorder with anxiety and depression. Hmm. And uh, it was because after we had struggled with years of infertility, we had had a series and, and a, a large number of failed adoptions. Wow. And from the first one, I bounced back. From the second one, I, I bounced back. From mm -hmm. about the seventh or eighth one, I wasn't bouncing back anymore. The, mm -hmm. the elasticity mm -hmm. in my soul had kind of gone. Yeah. And a lot of it was me depending on me. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have a fairly good mind. I can process things and, and figure them out. And I wasn't figuring things out the mm -hmm. same. And I wasn't, I wasn't able to cope. So I was at Moody, I was teaching at Moody, and we were lining up for the beginning of the semester, and I just wanted nothing more than to be curled up under my desk. Mm. And I thought, this is a little unusual. And my friend who works in the counseling program, uh, her name's Nancy, she said to me, you need to talk to somebody. And my response was, only screw-ups talk to people. Mm. I'm not going to talk to people. Now, right now, as I say, I can hear my pride. Right, right. But I wasn't going to be vulnerable, transparent, mm. and open like that because I had years of experience of having to hold it together for Kelly. Mm. And, and my idea of holding it together was, it's okay, dear, I'm a man, mm. and, and I'll be there for you. Mm. And so somehow that had to be shattered. And, and God took me on a journey with him where I went to speak to somebody and they diagnosed me. And first of all, I thought, well, that's awful. Mm -hmm. Now I've got a name for it, I have a label. Mm -hmm. And then I dealt with the label, I took the label to God. I pursued different books. I, I describe it to my students like being in the first part of Hansel and Gretel when they're following the breadcrumbs home. Right. You don't know the whole way out of the forest. You, you can't see how God is going to get you out of the anxiety mm. and the depression, but you can see where the next person that he wants you to meet is. You can see what the next book that he wants you to read is. You can see what the next sermon series that he wants you to listen to is. And I know that for some people, it's living with something that's more chemical and, and permanent. But for me, it was situational. Mm. And, and it was very real, and the symptoms were every bit clinical depression and anxiety but I had to follow God out of that dark place. 
And what does that mean? Like how it's for someone saying, you know, I'm in a dark place mm -hmm. and I don't know, know how to follow God mm -hmm. out of it. Like mm -hmm. what are some, are there, are there mm -hmm. things that you can communicate that might yes. relate? Yeah. Well, we talk a lot about brokenness mm -hmm. and, and the difference between uh, brokenness and, and then stubbornness <laughs> is mm -hmm. huge. See, a, a person who is in difficult circumstances and, and hates their life around them and they resist it, that person will have anxiety and depression. A person who sees the horrible things around them and accepts them, and this too is from God, that person will experience brokenness and then the first step to wellness is the step of surrender. Mm -hmm. So as they surrender entirely to God, so God leads them one step forward, another step forward. For me, the pattern of Philippians chapter four really took hold because I found it supremely unhelpful before I, I really read it deeply in these circumstances. Because it starts from verse four onwards, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Mm -hmm. And my response, and I know it sounds irreverent, was shut up. Yeah, why should I rejoice <laughs> in this? It sounds yeah. like give yourself a slap and pull yourselves up by your, your mm. bootstraps. Mm -hmm. But then it says, let your reasonableness or your gentleness be evident to all. So there's a reasonable way forward. Mm -hmm. It says the Lord is near. Mm -hmm. The Lord is close. What does that mean to us? What, what does it mean to have relationship with anybody, let alone with Jesus? And I found that Jesus, before this happened, was just an idea I had. Hmm. And, and I was committed to the idea of Jesus, but the person of Jesus, the, the, the relationship with a man, a true person, mm -hmm. he is near. So how does he take a hold of me? And then it said, be anxious for nothing, which again, my initial response mm -hmm. was just shut up. Right. I, I'm not interested because it doesn't make sense. But then through prayer and petition, hmm. let your requests be known to God and also with, with gratitude, Right. We uh, miss that part with often, gratitude. Time, right? That, that we miss the gratitude part. Right. Yeah. And then the peace of God, which yeah. transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. And what I found is as I unloaded this, I let myself feel it. You can't unload what you won't let yourself feel. Hmm. You, you can't give anxiety that you deny. You can only give anxiety that you acknowledge. And so to let the depression be there, to let the anxiety be there, and to give it, and to give it, and to give it. Mm -hmm. until from underneath that, the wellspring of the life that you already had in Christ Jesus, the peace of God comes out from underneath, that transcends all understanding. Mm -hmm. And I can mm -hmm. honestly say that I found it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it took years, but God led me out of the forest. What, what would you say to someone, because there really isn't a timeline, right? We can't figure right. out that God's timeline in that and why It may not be in this life. Yeah, I, I was going to say, what, what would you say to someone who is like, you know, I'm really, I've been struggling for quite a long time. I yeah. feel like I'm in the Word and I'm praying and I feel mm -hmm. like God is just, He doesn't care. Yeah. He's not yeah. paying attention. Like, yeah. what, how, how would you respond to that? for me, that yeah. valley was about three years through the worst of it. You know, Peter was talking about resisting. We're resisting what God is doing. Mm. And uh, for me, I had this certain idea of what my life was supposed to be like. Mm. And this is, this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. Here's the deal. I've served you all my life. You should give me a baby. Yeah. Right? You should give me this because I deserve it. And I've been your faithful servant. Mm. Um, and so for three years, I was just mad. I was resisting what he was doing and I was angry. Uh, and there was a moment that I call my epiphany or that point of surrender. Uh, and there's a story by Flannery O'Connor called Greenleaf, and there's this Christ-type image of a bull who pursues the main character, Mrs. May, and Mrs. May is resisting what mm. the bull wants to do and keeping her, keeping that bull out of her life, and she's furious because he keeps invading her property, and she keeps trying to keep him at bay, uh, but the bull's persistent. And at the end of the story, she goes out to have her hired hand shoot the bull once and for all. And at the end of the story, this bull, this Christ type, ends up goring her through the heart hmm. with one horn and wrapping the other horn around her. And it's an odd picture in hmm. Flannery O'Connor's, you know, she's known for kind of 
her violent imagery, imagery yeah. <laughs> um, which is shocking and startling, but that's her point. Like she wants to shock the reader mm -hmm. uh, into a point of epiphany. And she would say in every one of her stories, there's, that, there's a moment of grace where grace is there waiting to be accepted if you receive it. Mm. But it doesn't always look like we think it's supposed to look. Right. And so for me, we'd been struggling with infertility for three years and I'd been resisting and we finally got pregnant. And I was overjoyed, mm. you know, ah, of course, this is what God would do. Uh, and then just a few weeks later, we miscarried. Mm. And of course, I was furious. Like, how could you? It seemed like the cruelest of right, jokes right. to mm. finally give us what we wanted and then snatch it away, it away again. Yeah. And I woke up one morning and went down to the bathroom and uh, stood in front of the mirror. And it was as if scales fell off my eyes. And I my eyes were open to what God was doing, that he would persistently pursue me mm. to such a painful place mm -hmm. uh, so that I could see and that he would wrap, a, wrap his arm around me, right? As piercing as that mm. miscarriage was, that he was also there wanting to embrace me, mm -hmm. wanting to hold me close, wanting me to see, mm -hmm. wanting to be enough. Right. Mm. That's wanting it, yeah. to be enough. Yes. And so mm -hmm. that's that surrender that mm -hmm. Peter was talking about. It took that, it took mm -hmm. the miscarriage for right. me to be ready and to say, okay, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. okay, mm -hmm. I surrender. Mm -hmm. With the pain. Yeah. The thing yeah. is that you still sat with the pain. Because in your question, yeah. the idea is, God hasn't come through for me yet because I haven't got ease and comfort. Mm. And somehow in our culture, it's like we're all enti entitled to ease and comfort at mm. some point. And God is the means to get there. But what if the pain is the means to get you to God? Yeah, right. And you see, the end of the journey is not ease and comfort, is not feeling great. The end of the journey is God himself. Mm. And so if the pain takes you there, and if the pain keeps you there, then he may need to leave you with the pain. And that is something that this culture, 20-somethings that we talk about, the point of pain, the reason for pain, is lost on us mm. because we're so sanitized, because we, we've removed pain from the equation so much. We've had helicopter moms raising us right. so that we don't have to experience any mm. pain. Then the 20s hit, and it's the first part of being exposed to pain, mm. and we're at a loss, whereas actually the pain may be what God uses to speak most loudly, as C.S. Lewis would say, to bring us into the relationship we were always designed for. And if the pain persists, it may be a blessing to keep us there. Wow. Well, mm. that was a perfect way to end the show because we have <laughs> run out of time. But the bottom line in that mm. is that there is pain and suffering, but God uses it because he wants himself to be enough in our lives because yeah. nothing yes. else will ever satisfy and no. we have yeah. to go through painful experiences to get to that place of surrender and say is mm. God enough yes mm. and have the answer be yes yes and mm. that is the essence of every decade of our lives right mm -hmm. amen to that well you guys have been awesome I've loved having you on the Thanks. show Listen. if you don't have the book yet you need to get out and get it 20 things we tell our 20 something selves it'd be a great gift for someone and even if you're not in your 20s there is just a lot of wisdom to be had let me pray before we wrap yes. up father god thank you so much that you are a god that does pursue us that you are persistent and consistent god that your love is unconditional even those are even though ours is so conditional oftentimes based on emotion God, thank you that you love us, Lord, that you do not forsake us. Thank you that you use pain to let us see the beauty of who you are and, and to surrender and to be in more intimate relationship with you. God, that you would be the, the only one that we cling to and the one that satisfies. I um, thank you for Kelly and Peter and Lord, the favor that is on their lives. Thank you that your, your blessing is on them um, and that your favor is on everything that they do and that uh, they would continue to walk in your ways um, as husband and wife. Thank you for bringing them together and making uh, two uh, better than one could have been by themselves. We thank you, God, and we pray these things in your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Lisa. Good times. Mm -hmm.